Hey, very good. Uh, right. Thanks, Andreas. Move to full screen. Okay. Yeah, so there was a very good question for the break. So uh, we, we use this reflection coupling. And then if we look at the distance process, it sometimes increases the distance and it sometimes decreases the distance. And on average, you don't gain. So then uh, how, how can this be? Oh, maybe I should wait for a few seconds. Okay, so on average, you don't gain. And, and so how, how can you gain from something like that? And uh, so there are somehow two answers to that. Uh, so one, one thing you can see that you gain is uh, the, if, if you look at the distance between xt and yt, this is really some one dimensional process. And the fluctuations, the noise is done in such a way that just this one dimensional process gets fluctuations. So, so somehow, if you look at the difference of the two, it will, of the two Brownian motions, it will also give you only something one dimensional because you, you do this uh, reflection. And so, so you have a one dimensional process which now randomly oscillates. And then you know if you have something like this, then after some time it will hit zero. So it will make the distance process hit zero in a finite time. And, and once you hit zero, you're at the same position. And if you're at the same position, then you move on with synchronous coupling and then you stay at the same position. So that's somehow the original argument of Lindvall and Rogers. So they showed that it meets in a finite time. And then from this, you get total variation bounds. Now, I'd like to give a different argument, uh, which is saying that you can get a contraction in such a Wasserstein distance, but only if you choose such a concave function. And so why is that? Well, if you have your distance process, it sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. In average, you don't gain. But now you apply a concave function to the distance process. So then when you go up, uh, because the function is concave, you lose less. And if you go down by the concavity, you gain more. So now if you apply this concave function, then on average you gain. And in that way, you can really get an average gain, not in the usual L1 Wasserstein distance, but in this concave distance. And uh, so this you can use. And so you can get the following. So, so our condition is now the following, for example. So we still assume strong convexity, but only outside a given ball. There are also other results which avoid this, but in the simplest result, we assume strong convexity, but outside a given ball with fixed radius r. And then uh, globally, we just assume an upper Lipschitz bound with constant L. So just in one, just one-sided Lipschitz bound. Yeah, so that means we only assume the convexity at large distances, but uh, inside we only assume uh, this bound here. And we assume that this constants L, K and R are given. Now, if this is the case, then you can design uh, such a concave function F, which looks like this. And such that uh, with respect to this concave function f, the wf distance will be contracted. So you can show you can design a concave function f such that the average of f of the distance process is exponentially decaying with a rate c that you can explicitly compute. Yeah, so the trick is somehow that. If you look at this distance, at this difference here, then this, uh, you, you have something like martingale plus something, or even a sub martingale. But then if you apply this concave function, it turns it into a super martingale, so into something that is really contracting. Okay, so the statement is you can find the concave function f, which looks the following way it has a jump at zero. Okay, I come to the question in a second. Uh, it has a jump at zero. Uh, so this is 
because we want to be able to bound the total variation distance, we don't have to include the jump, but we can. Then it starts with slope one, then the slope goes down until a certain uh, radius R1, and then afterwards the slope stays constant. So then it's again linear. Uh, so you can find such a function which is explicitly given and uh, explicit constants C A M R1. So A is this constant here, M is this slope, C is this decay rate and R1 is this constant. And they only depend on these parameters L, K and R such that you get this contractivity. Yeah, and this you can prove by Ito's formula. And then as a consequence, you get the contractivity in this WF distance. Okay, so now there was a question. Uh, yeah, this is Andre here. Um, so is the dependence uh, on R typically exponential in, in the little c? Uh, the dependence on R, well, this, this depends. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, if, if you have, I mean, if you have a potential like a double well, then what will enter is, uh, yeah, so, so then you will have something exponential, actually worse than exponential because uh, somehow uh, the, the non-convexity uh, can cause you to have such, such a mountain pass here. Yeah, something like this that you have to cross and this will slow down uh, your convergence exponentially in the height of the mountain, in, in the height of this mountain pass, and that will be reflected here. On the other hand, uh, if if you're in a situation where you do not have strong convexity, but maybe still convexity, so maybe some flat piece, uh, then it will not be exponential. Thanks. Okay, uh, so that's what you can get, and so all the con so so all the constants that occur here, and this function f, they can be explicitly written down, and they only depend on these parameters l, k, and r. And so this tells you if your l, k, and r, if you can choose them in a fixed way, uh, then you get dimension-free bounds. Of course, that's a big if. Uh, you assume that outside a ball of fixed radius, you have strong convexity. Of course, in many situations, the ball will depend on, uh, the radius will depend on the dimension and then you do not get dimension-free results. Okay, but if you have that, you get dimension-free results. There are also some variants of this approach which give dimension-free results in other contexts. Okay, so then the bound, this, this bound also gives you t total variation bounds. That was another shortcoming of the synchronous coupling uh, because you have this jump in the distance function. And because of this, you can just upper bound the total variation distance by this WF distance. And so if you have this WF decay, then you get also bounds for the total variation distance. Yeah, just, just use, uh, this inequality here. Okay, and it also allows arbitrary initial loss. So you don't need any warm start. You can just start at a Dirac mass. You can just start at a single point. That's a question. Yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me well? Uh, yeah, somehow, yeah. Let me get the microphone. Yeah, so uh, the question is about, so here you introduce this F. Uh, could we prove directly what you're proving without the F, but directly with the indicator of, uh, of uh, the positive real line? So that's the first question. And the no. second, oh no, okay. So it's really just a device to get to TV. I was wondering if this WF gave us a bigger class of test functions in the, in the dual expression than you would get if you were to use directly the, the TV dual formulation. So the, the point about the WF is you can get bounds in all types of norms. But uh, if you want to get contraction, then you have to choose the right norm. And this WF is what gives you contraction. 
For example, if you choose total variation distance, then first for a long time, your distance will maybe be equal to one or close to one. And then only after a long time, you will get a strong decay of the total variation distance. So you will not have some uniform contraction in time. Now this WF gives you really some way to uniformly distribute the contractivity over time. Okay, so you, yeah, you, so you use it as a, as a, a, a Lyapunov function, I guess. But so, so yeah, and, and does F in itself, like this WF in itself, does it give you, like, so it's bigger than the TV. So does it give you, a, a, like, are there any instances where you can find functions that, you know, guarantee that uh, uh, um, a mu T and mu are against a bigger class of test functions than the uh, continuous inbounded you would get for TV? Yes, you can also bound uh, it. You can also bound the L1 Wasserstein distance by WF, for example. Okay, okay. So thank you. So get W1 bounds. Thank you. Yeah, and you could also do modifications that such that you can control higher order Wasserstein distances, but that would require some modification of this basic approach. Okay. Uh, so that's the coupling approach. Uh, so here are some more references. This is the original paper by Lindvall and Rogers. And uh, the way I looked at it uh, was introduced in, in this paper. Well, it, it actually goes back to results of Chen and Wang uh, from about 2000. And then uh, in, in the way I put it here, it was introduced in this paper in PTIF. Okay, so that was one approach. That was the coupling approach. Now I said there's the second approach, which is more analytic. And at this we look now. Uh, so we look at relaxation times and both in L2 and for entropy. Okay, so I've so instead of Wasserstein distances, we are now considering divergences, which are some kind of non-symmetric distances. Well, not really distances. So uh, the chi-square divergence of a probability measure mu to mu, that's just uh, the integral of uh, the relative density minus one squared with respect to mu, if there is a relative density. And otherwise it's defined to be plus infinity. Uh, similarly, you can define the kullback leipler divergence or the relative entropy so this is just the integral of rho log rho d mu if you have a density and otherwise it's defined to be plus infinity. So you see that these distances are sometimes infinite. Okay, so now a nice thing about, about these divergences, uh, which are just two special cases of general divergences, is uh, that if you take an invariant probability measure and you have a Markov process with that invariant measure, then uh, the chi-square divergence of your lower time t with respect to the invariant measure is non-increasing in t and the same for the relative entropy. So this is something you do not have for Wasserstein distances, but you have for these divergences. So therefore, uh, these are very natural objects to look at. And uh, now you can define relaxation times for these quantities. And so the L2 relaxation time is just defined as the first time where uh, the chi-square divergence of your law at time t with respect to mu has decreased by a factor of one over e with respect to the initial chi-square divergence for any initial law nu. Of course, this might be infinite, but then uh, this inequality is trivially satisfied. Okay, so the same you can define for relative entropy. So the entropy relaxation time is just the first time where the relative entropy has decayed by a factor one over E for any initial law. Again, note uh, that this can be infinite. So for example, if nu is a Dirac measure, it will typically be infinite. 
Okay, so now you want to control mixing times by these, but uh, this is not possible without further restriction because uh, of these infinities here. So if you have the wrong initial law, your right-hand side will just be infinite. And, and so a statement on these relaxation times will mean, will mean nothing for this initial law. Yeah. So therefore we have to restrict ourselves to nice initial laws. And that's what is called a warm start. So we have to restrict ourselves to an M warm start. So an M warm start means uh, the, the initial law has a density with respect to the invariant measure, which is bounded by a constant M. Yeah, and then we can look at the mixing time, which only con takes into account initial laws that are already M warm. Of course, this is somehow restrictive because usually if you can sample from something M warm, uh, then you have already done half of the thing. Usually the problem is that you cannot even create something M warm. Okay, but anyway, uh, that this is what we can control in that way. And uh, so then you define mixing time as before. So the first time where the total variation distance is smaller than epsilon, but uh, for any initial law, which is M warm. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, so can you show that uh, after the mixing time, you still stay warm so that this can be iterated to obtain a rate of convergence? Uh, say again, what can be iterated? So if you start warm, is it easy to show that after the, that at the mixing time, the distribution is still going to stay warm? So they basically this condition on the uh, relative density, does, is that preserved by the evolution? Um, okay, so that would mean, okay, so that would mean some L infinity contractivity. Uh, so this- okay, It's just a bound, it doesn't have to be contracted. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe. I'm not too much an expert on M warm things. Um, maybe there are people in the audience who know better than me. Um, Thanks. We can think about it. The answer is yes. Okay. Should I, should I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, okay, so what you can do now is bound uh, this mixing time from an M warm start uh, by this relaxation times. And actually what you can see is, uh, this is also not so difficult to show. I, yeah wrote exercise, uh, you, you can show that you can bound the mixing time by the L2 relaxation time, but then uh, you get a factor log M in front. And you get something better for the entropy relaxation time. You can bound it by this one, but here you only get a factor log log M in front. And that's important because often the M will be exponentially large. Like if we are in a product space, then, then your uniform upper bound will typically be exponentially large in the dimension. And then if you take only the log, that might still not be good enough. But if you take log log, it's usually quite good. Yeah, so that means uh, in particular from these uh, entropy relaxation bounds, you can also get quite good bounds on mixing times, although restricted to an M warm start. Okay, so then the question is, how can you control these relaxation times? And <clears throat> here the nice thing is uh, that there, there's a nice analytic theory, which gives uh, analytic condition for exponential decay of the chi-square divergence and the relative entropy in terms of functional inequalities. And 
So these are the following. So we introduce the Dirichlet form, which is associated to our generator. So that's just the quadratic form on the L2 space with respect to the measure mu, which corresponds to the generator. And by integration by parts, you see that in our case, this quadratic form is just the integral of gradient F gradient G D mu. So that's our Dirichlet form. And, and now you assume reversibility. Yeah, so you assume that B is minus gradient of U. Uh, part of the results are also true if you do not have reversibility, but in that case, they are usually not so sharp. Okay, so we assume reversibility, then you have the following equivalence. You have exponential decay of the chi-square divergence with a prefactor e to the minus t over c, if and only if you have a Poincaré inequality, that means if and only if you can bound the variance of the function f, so this quantity here, by the constant c times the Dirichlet form, for any smooth test function. Yeah, so exponential decay of chi-square divergence is equivalent to a Poincaré inequality. And similarly, you can show that exponential decay of the relative entropy with this rate is equivalent to a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. And logarithmic Sobolev inequality is a bit stronger than Poincaré inequality. It says that you can bound the integral of f squared times the logarithm of f squared. And then you have here some normalization by uh, the Dirichlet form. Yeah, so that turns out to be exactly equivalent in the reversible case to the exponential decay of the relative entropy. Okay, let me give an informal proof of the second statement. This is very informal. Uh, the, the rigorous proof would be much longer, but uh, you see in principle how it works. So it's just an informal computation with density. So let's assume the law at time t is absolutely continuous with respect to our invariant measure. And it has a smooth density, rho t, and this density is bounded from below by a strictly positive constant. I mean, the rigorous part is then how to get rid of these constraints, uh, but uh, this I skip here. So let, let's assume this. Now then you can compute the time derivative of the relative entropy. So that's the, just the time derivative of the integral of rho t log rho t d mu. And now you can just formally differentiate under the integral. And then you can use the Kolmogorov forward equation telling you that the time derivative of rho t is equal to L star rho t. Actually here in the reversible case, L star is equal to L, but it, I write it in that way because that's the equation in the general case. Yeah, so you use this and then you use the chain rule here, then you get this expression here. Okay, and now you put the L star to the other side. So put an L here. And then you see you have here minus the Dirichlet form evaluated at rho t and log rho t. So the one disappears because if you apply, apply L to one, you get zero. Okay, so that means you get this one here minus integral nabla rho t, nabla log rho t d mu. And now you can just apply the chain rule and see that this is the same as this expression here, which is minus four, the Dirichlet form of the square root of rho t. Okay, and now you insert your log Sobolev inequality. Your log Sobolev inequality tells you that you can control the relative entropy by this Dirichlet form. And so if you insert that, then, then you get this bound here. And then you have shown that the time derivative of the relative entropy is bounded from above by minus two over C times the relative entropy, which gives you the exponential decay. Now, so that's very instructive to do this formal com computation and uh, you, you can make it rigorous, but the rigorous proof is much longer.
Okay, so now you know that if you have Poincaré or Loxobolev inequality, then you can bound uh, your uh, relaxation time or uh, your entropy relaxation time. Yeah? So you can bound the relaxation, the L2 relaxation time by one half the Poincaré constant in the way I have defined it. I mean, this one half depends on how you define these constants. And you can define the entropy relaxation time by one half the log Sobolev constant. And actually it turns out you have equalities here in the reversible case. Okay, so that means uh, your L2 relaxation time is really uh, the Poincaré constant basically, which is the inverse of the spectral gap of the generator and your entropy relaxation time is really the log Sobolev constant basically in the reversible case. Okay, so then you're left with the question, how can you bound this constants? Uh, and well, for Poincaré constants, for spectral gaps, there are a lot of techniques for bounding these. For log Sobolev constants, it's a bit more difficult, but meanwhile, there are also a lot of techniques. And I just give you the most widely used result. Uh, which is a combination of the buckley emery criterion and the holly Stroop perturbation lemma. And this says the following. So suppose your, your potential U can be decomposed in a strongly convex part V. So for V, the Hessian is bounded from below by a positive constant K and a bounded perturbation W. So for W, the oscillation, that means the supremum minus the infimum is bounded by a constant by a finite constant m. Yeah, so for example, if you have such a double well potential, then you can do that. So, so you can find a strongly convex uh, potential, for example, which looks on the outside like this one, looks on the outside like this one, and then on the inside stays strongly convex, something like that. And then you see your potential is a bounded perturbation of this strongly convex thing. So you can apply this criterion here. So if you have that, then you get a log Sobolev inequality and the constant is given by K multiplied by E to the M, uh, where M is uh, the size of this perturbation. Okay, you have also other things like you have factorization lemmas to get log Sobolev in higher dimensions and so on. Uh, very nice reference. If, <laughs> if you want to know more about these analytic approaches, <clears throat> the standard reference is the book by Bakri Jean Tildedou on analysis and geometry of Markov diffusion operators. Yeah, and uh, the second reference I gave here are, is some shorter introduction to log Sobolev inequalities. So if you somehow want the main want some of the main statements in a more brief form, uh, that might be another possibility. Okay, uh, any questions up to here? Okay, so then uh, we are through with uh, the continuous time Markov processes, but now of course uh, we want an algorithm. So we have to discretize time. Yeah, and if we do that, we end up with what is usually called Langevin algorithms, uh, but really it refers to the overdamped Langevin dynamics. So we again look at the overdamped Langevin dynamics as we introduced it before. And now to get an algorithm, we discretize this. And well, the easiest way to do is just to do an Euler discretization. Of course, you can also use more advanced discretization schemes, but uh, also Euler discretization here works quite well in that case. Okay, so that if you do that, if you look at the Euler discretization and the transition step is given by, so if you're at position X, then you move to X minus H times nabla U of X. 
plus square root 2h times z, where z is standard normally distributed. Yeah, so you have an iteration with this transition step and that defines a Markov process in discrete time, so a Markov chain. Of course, uh, you have to fix the step size h here. Yeah. Okay, so that gives a Markov chain and the transition kernel has a density which I have written down explicitly here. Okay, so you have this Markov chain. So the first possibility is you now say, uh, this Markov chain is an approximation of my diffusion. So I just use this Markov chain for approximate sampling. Yeah, so I don't change anything. I just use this Euler discretization. And if you do that, uh, then it's called the unadjusted Langevin algorithm. Yeah, so the un unadjusted Langevin algorithm is just simulating the Euler discretization of the overdent Langevin diffusion. Okay, so now let, let's see what, uh, which problems could, could occur with this algorithm. So let's again look at our simplest example where our target distribution is the standard normal distribution. So that means gradient of u of x is just x. Now, in that case, if you look at that process here, so from x, you move to x minus h times x plus square root two h z. This is just an autoregressive process. So this is just a very simple Gaussian process in discrete time. And you, you can compute everything explicitly for this process. In particular, you can easily find the invariant measure. And it's this one. So it's a normal distribution with mean zero. And the covariance matrix is the identity, but multiplied by a prefactor. So that means it's not the same as our target distribution mu. So our discretization has a different invariant measure uh, than the diffusion process. Of course, that's not, not a surprise if you discretize, why should you preserve the invariant measure if, if you just discretize in some way? Yeah, okay, so we have a different invariant measure. And that's, of course, a disadvantage. That means you have a bias, but not just at fixed time, but even asymptotically, a bias that does not vanish in the limit. So if you fix your step size h, then you will just approximate the, the wrong invariant measure. So you can run as long as you want. You, you will not get closer than uh, the error, which is between these two invariant measures. So this you have to take into account. On the other hand, of course, if H is small, uh, then this asymptotic bias gets small. And now let's say, let's see how small it is. So we look at the L2 Wasserstein distance between mu H and mu. We could also look at some other distances, but this is the easiest one to compute. Yeah, so that was the minimal of the L2 norm over all couplings and here, uh, turns out that in this case, the synchronous coupling is optimal because these are both Gaussian distributions. Uh, so both centered Gaussian distributions. So you find that the synchronous coupling is optimal. And so therefore you can exactly write this L2 Wasserstein distance in this form here. Yeah, so this is just the synchronous coupling between Z drawn from U and this is a random variable drawn from mu h. That's the synchronous coupling of these two. Okay, and now this you can compute, of course. You get exactly this value here, which behaves like one quarter h d to the one half. So that's the bias between these two measures. And, and now you want to make this smaller than some given epsilon. And then you see in order to do that, you have to choose H of the order D to the minus one half times epsilon inverse, at least. Yeah, so here you see a disadvantage towards metropolis algorithms. So for metropolis algorithms, if you have exponential convergence to equilibrium, then this will only depend logarithmically on epsilon inverse, but here it will really depend on epsilon inverse because you have this asymptotic bias. 
Now, on the other hand, what you get here is a d to the minus one half. So you have to choose h of this order, at least. Yeah. So then the question is, is this also enough? And uh, you can give a positive answer to that in certain cases. And I've just stated a simple result, but there are much better results available. So here I assume strong convexity just for simplicity. This is not necessary. I assume global Lipschitz. And then the third thing I assume is that you have a, a strong error bound on the Euler discretization. Yeah, so you can bound the strong error of the Euler discretization. So that means the L2 norm of the difference between the Euler discretization and the diffusion uniformly on a finite time interval, say zero one for the diffusion by some constant M times H. Okay, and then uh, what you get is uh, that, that you can bound this distance between the two invariant measures by this constant here times mh. And as a consequence, you get that you can bound the distance of the Euler chain after n steps to equilibrium in this way here. Okay, as I said, uh, this can be relaxed uh, substantially and actually uh, the real expert on this unadjusted Langevin algorithm is Alain Durmus, who's also participating in this program. And, and you can find his papers with Eric Moulin and with De Bortoli, which give uh, much better results than this. But uh, the question that you have to answer now is, how does this M depend on the dimension? And uh, this is something we have looked at in a recent work with Alain. And it turns out that the M depends on the dimension like D to the one half for nice models. So that's the same as in the Gaussian case, but for general models, it might have a, a worse dimension dependence. Yeah, so that's something interesting for for actually a quite broad class of nice models, you really get this d to the one half dependence here. But uh, there, there are, I mean, we do not have really an example, but uh, it, it seems quite clear that there are models where you get this worse dimension dependence. When you talk about models, you're talking about you? Yes, I'm talking about you, exactly. And so what kind of properties do you need for you? I mean, is it like, I mean, yeah, basically, it's yeah. There, there's some bound on on uh, what is it? Uh, um, so so on. You you have to take the Laplacian of the gradient of U, and I, I think you have to take the squared Euclidean norm, and you have to look at how that depends on the dimension. And it turns out that, for example, for product models or for models that have a density with respect to a Gaussian or for yeah, mean field models and things like that, uh, this dimension depends. It's like this d to the one half, but, but uh, we believe it's not the case for general models. Uh, was there another question? Oh, no, I just said thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's the unadjusted Langevin. And so alternatively, of course, uh, you, you can now use uh, the Euler step just as a proposal for Metropolis Hastings. And if you do that, uh, then you get the Metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm. And this now has the correct uh, invariant measure, but it's mathematically harder to analyze. Now, first you can get a negative result again using conductance. So you can show that again, if you have Gaussian target distribution, then you have a similar result as for random walk metropolis. So the mixing time, if you start in the neighborhood of zero is lower bounded by e to the h squared d over four. 
So for random walk metropolis, you had here h times d, now you have h squared times d. So you have gained something. Okay, but it tells you that if you want to start from a cold start, if you, for example, want to start at zero, then you have to choose h of order d to the minus one half. Yeah, so you don't have a chance otherwise. Uh, this is only for a cold start. So for a warm start, uh, it might actually improve here. Okay, and then the question is, can you also have a converse result? And uh, there's a very nice paper I maybe would be interested in to learn more because there are some authors here in the audience, I think. Uh, which, which gives some converse result and says uh, that, that you can get mixing from a warm start in order d to the one half log d steps. And that was actually an open problem because uh, together with, this, with these uh, acceptance rejection steps that you have in, in Mala, it's not so easy uh, to, to identify the precise order of the algorithm. Okay, so then I come to the last part. So somehow all these algorithms uh, were quite traditional that we looked at so far. And recently uh, there's some interest in looking at uh, MCMC methods where you use degenerate noise. And uh, so what's the idea behind that? Uh, somehow vaguely the idea is if you have too much randomness then this could lead to slow mixing because you have something to diffuse it, like diffusive behavior, which is slow and other things. So injecting too much randomness into your system might not be so good. So somehow if you inject less randomness, it makes the mathematical analysis harder, but uh, it might be beneficial. Okay, and then uh, we come actually to a very parallel thing like we saw in the optimization. So in the optimization, then uh, we were also looking at, uh, at second order methods after the first order methods. And we have something similar now here. We also look at second order and the first second order thing in continuous time is Langevin dynamics. So in Langevin dynamics, if you look at it as, at an as an equation for X, it's now a second order SDE, but uh, we write it as a first order SDE by introducing uh, the velocity. That means the derivative of the position. So we change the state space now to having position and velocity. So that means the state space is now RD times RD. But the velocity is, not, is, is only artificial. Uh, yeah, so we are only using it uh, to invent uh, new dynamics from the point of view of sampling. From the physical point of view, of course, it's a different story. Okay, so our SDE is now derivative of position is the velocity. And then the derivative of the velocity is minus the gradient of u of xt. And if you do this on your own, on its own, then this is just Hamiltonian dynamics. And Hamiltonian dynamics turns out to have the invariant measure that we will be interested in. But of course, it's usually not mixing because it preserves the energy. And, and so it's not ergodic. So we have to add something to it to make it ergodic. And then there are two possibilities. About the second possibility, we will hear uh, this afternoon in the talk by Nishit Vishnoi, uh, which is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And so the first possibility is to, to add something like this. So, so you add Brownian motion times a parameter square root two gamma, which corresponds to random collisions. And you add a damping term minus gamma Vt. Yeah, and this equation here is really uh, somehow physical Brownian motion. So this is really like particles in physics are moving if they are driven by Brownian motion. Okay, so in physics, the parameter you introduce here is the friction, gamma. You could also introduce a mass here and 
this might actually be a matrix, but uh, I dropped this here for simplicity. Okay, so that's launch van dynamics. It has a unique solution for given initial law. It's a Markov process on R2D and its invariant measure is actually the boltzmann gibbs measure, which is in this case is just the product of the measure mu we are interested in and a standard normal distribution. So that means if we can sample from this measure, then we can also sample from mu because mu is just the first marginal of the measure. Okay, and the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution, this has a density again with respect to the back measure and the density is just E to the minus the Hamiltonian. So E to the minus the total energy and <laughs> total energy if the mass is equal to one is just U of X, the potential plus one half V squared. Okay, so that's the dynamics that preserves this measure and Somehow, since it's a second order dynamics, and since we only inject the noise in, in the second component, we have less randomness. Now you can also say it's moving more, more smoothly. Brownian motion is wiggling around all time, but here it's moving more, more smoothly because the Brownian motion is only in the velocity. And if we go to the position, uh, then we are integrating once more, yeah. Okay, so we denote by PT uh, the transition function of this Markov process. Okay, and then we might ask about the mixing properties of this dynamics. And there we again look at our uh, running example. So we look at a normal distribution as a target. Uh, now I can take a normal distribution with a general covariance matrix C. So C is a general symmetric positive definite matrix. That's our target distribution. And so that means our function U of X is now this one. And then the SDE can now be written in this form. So the derivative of XV Differential of XV is just minus a matrix A times XV dt plus noise. So that means that's a linear SDE and the matrix A takes this form. Okay, so you see uh, that the process XV is a Gaussian process because it's described by a linear, by, by a linear drift perturbed additively by Brownian motion. Uh, and so in that case, uh, your solution to the SDE is a Gaussian process. So that means all laws are Gaussian and can be computed explicitly. Okay, and that allows us again to study this uh, exactly. So in particular, we can look at the Wasserstein contraction coefficient and it's easiest to do in L2. So that, what, what is that? So we look at the time T and then we see how, how much the Wasserstein distance is de has decreased up to time t. So we look at the Wasserstein distance between the law at time t when starting at mu and the law at time t when starting at mu divided by the Wasserstein distance of mu and mu. And we take the supremum over all mu and mu. Okay, so that's the Wasserstein contraction coefficient. And uh, you can show that actually you can restrict yourself here to Dirac measures. So you can replace mu and mu by Dirac measures and, and you get the same supremum here. So this is the same as the supremum over all X not equal to Y. And if you insert here for mu and mu Dirac measures, then you get here PTX, you get here PTY. And here you get the Wasserstein distance of Dirac measures delta X and delta Y and that's just the Euclidean distance of X and Y. Okay, so you, you can write your Wasserstein contraction coefficient in this form. And now in this case, uh, PTX and PTY are both Gaussian measures with the same covariance. And so therefore you know that the synchronous coupling is optimal. So therefore you can compute this W2 distance. And if you do that, you find that it's exactly equal to the operator norm of E to the minus TA where A is this matrix. Okay, and now you're in business because you know how this operator norm behaves. 
it behaves asymptotically like e to the minus t lambda, where lambda is the bottom of the spectrum of A, so the infimum of the real part of the spectrum of A. Yeah, and this you can compute explicitly for this matrix because uh, you can diagonalize. And so you just have to do it for two times two matrix. And, and then you find uh, that this decay rate lambda is given by gamma over two times one minus the square root of this positive part here, where the sigma i squared are the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Okay, and what this means, you see best in a picture. If I now, now draw lambda as a function of gamma, then you see as long as gamma is small, then uh, this number here will be larger than one. So this positive part will vanish and you will just have gamma half. So as long as gamma is small, uh, this will increase linearly in gamma, the lambda. And that's the underdamped region. Now, of course, if gamma is zero, if you don't put noise, you do not have mixing, it's not ergodic. Then if you put noise, if you put more noise, it increases linearly with the noise. But now it does not increase all the time. It stops increasing at a certain point. And uh, this is the point where in the spectral decomposition for A, you, you change between real and uh, non-real spectrum. So at this point it changes and then it goes down again. Yeah, so you see your decay rate depends on gamma, but it's not optimal to choose gamma as large as possible. So to inject as much noise as possible, but uh, there's a certain amount of noise that gives you the fastest mixing. Yeah, and this is exactly given by gamma equal to two over the maximum of the sigma i's. And if you do that, <clears throat> then your lambda is just one over the maximum of the sigma i's. Now, sigma i's are something like standard deviations. So that's something like one over the size of the system somehow. So this is kinetic behavior. So your rate behaves like one over the size of the system. Yeah, so if you choose the second order dynamics and uh, you, you're in this region between underdamped and overdamped, then you get this kinetic behavior, which is faster than diffusive behavior. And again, there's a connection to yesterday where we also saw this uh, three, th this factor three, uh, which was at, at somehow at borderline between underdamped and overdamped and, and, and what's the best you could do. I have a question. Can, can you make the same analysis in this Gaussian case if you decouple the gamma that you put in front as a friction coefficient and the one that you put as a noise term? So if you take two parameters for those? Yes, you can. You can. Yes. That's going to tell you to take this, the same value. Um, you get you get a different invariant measure if you don't take the same value. I mean, taking the same value. So if we look at the SDE here, we have to do it in this way if we want to get the right invariant measure. Yeah. So you can put say some other factor here in front, but this will change your invariant measure. Then the invariant measure will not be e to the minus u, but for example, e to the minus beta u. Okay, thanks. I have a question too. Yes. Um, so in this Gaussian example, the, uh, the potential is, is it like max uh, one over sigma i strongly convex? So is the contraction rate exactly the same as what we had for the overdamped Langevin? No, it's better than for overdamped Langevin. So for overdamped Langevin, you would get a sigma i squared here. So for overdamped Langevin, this is diffusive. And so therefore you get uh, one over the system size squared. But here you get just one over the sigma i. So actually like the eigenvalues of CR, the sigma i squared. Yes, the eigenvalues of C are the sigma i squared. 
So sigma i's are like standard deviations. Okay, good. So this shows that you can really gain by degenerate noise, but that you have to do it in the right way that you really have to, to inject uh, the right amount of noise. And of course, this is only in the Gaussian case. And now you can ask, can you prove something like this more generally? And uh, yeah, there are indeed some results doing that recently. So first in the strongly convex case, you can use synchronous coupling and that has first been done in a paper by Cheng et al. And then improved in, in a paper by Dalali Lian and Ryu Durand. Now in the non-convex case, you can again use some reflection coupling, but not the one I introduced. Uh, you actually have to design some special reflection coupling for this degenerate noise situation which only couples to, to a hyperplane. And, but, but then you can also get results, uh, in corresponding results in non-convex cases. So these are the coupling approaches. And then recently there has been a very interesting analytic approach by Xiao, Lu and Wang. So they consider a fairly general case, assuming a warm start. And what they use is a functional inequality, but actually a new one, a space-time Poincaré inequality. And so this is a recent approach due to Armstrong Mura, which allows you uh, to deal with such situations with degenerate noise. And uh, this seems also to be quite powerful and to, to give quite interesting and, and sharp results. Uh, so, seems certainly worse uh, to look more detail also in this approach. Okay, so that, that was uh, Langevin. And then we will hear in the afternoon about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And uh, the difference is easily explained. You again have the Hamiltonian dynamics, but instead of adding this part in the diffusion, you just run Hamiltonian dynamics for some time. And then you inject your noise by choosing a new velocity, either completely newly choosing the velocity or partially updating the velocity. So if you do that, you get another dynamics, which corresponds to something like a Boltzmann equation. And uh, so then we can ask the same question, what, what can we say about this dynamics and, and about this uh, we will hear uh, in, in the talk by Nishit this afternoon or for me this night. Okay, uh, that's all on my talk. Uh, since I can't be here, I thought it might be nice if you later you have questions that there's a possibility to ask. So I will, availab I will be available tomorrow on Zoom uh, before the conference starts. Uh, on, on this Zoom link. Okay, thank you very much. And then, uh, yeah, are there questions? Questions? So you, the la Langevin diffusion can be seen as gradient descent with noise. So what if we try to do it with, say, Newton steps? Like that is normalize the gradient with the Hessian at the point. Um, yes. So, OK, so there's. Uh, there's also the Riemannian manifold uh, HMC method. Um, I'm the, but but I haven't uh, haven't considered this. But maybe this goes in this direction. Um, I don't know. I, 
I, I think there's some like other, I think Ozaki discretization or something. I guess there's some other version of this that does do like a Hessian type, like Newton type of update, but I'm not quite sure like how, how much of analysis there is. Yeah, so so definitely I'm not not aware of uh, of of results in this direction. Uh, it it might be an interesting thing to look at, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like the sheet added a comment there on the chat. All right, any other questions? Hang on one second. Um, yeah, so I was curious about this result that um, you mentioned about, I mean, that you can pick somehow the F. Um, I think it was when you were, I mean, this, there was an F that would define a metric and under this metric you had this contraction uh, you know, and it was kind of like one specific one that would work. And yesterday we heard about kind of geodesic convexity and there was one similar um, situation where you had a function that with the wrong metric, you didn't have any sort of convexity, but if you choose the metric appropriately, then suddenly you have kind of geodesic convexity. So I was wondering if there's somehow a connection between these two situations, maybe um, if there is something like, like like that, like that you're picking your metric in such a way that your F somehow is making something do that it come back in some sense. Uh, I was wondering if there's such a connection. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I did not yet attend the talk, the, the not, for me night talks yesterday because that was around midnight. Uh, I'm, I'm still planning to, to listen to the video. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, yeah. All right, if there are no other questions, please join me in thanking Andreas again for. Thank you.